Tea's coming, Stephen. Thank you. Right, would you like a piece of... Yes, please. Like one of these? Thank you. Right. It's morning tea, and time for a special ritual in the Bailey household. 365 pieces of paper in there, and all the grandchildren and all the children sent notes, photos, memories. And I love our Mary Jo. So do I. Stephen is one of the nearly 500,000 Australians living with dementia. And Susan is one of around 1.6 million people involved in their care. So what's this one about, Stephen? The wedding anniversary at uh, Corroboree Park. That's 12 years ago. That's Emma. Every story helps Stephen to recall memories that might otherwise slip away. I remember how much Grandpa enjoyed going to live music in Canberra. I'm glad we took all the children to the plays. Hey, hey. Thank you for remembering. Dementia is one of the biggest and most baffling health challenges facing Australians. It's surprising how good the memory is when you're recalling things you enjoy from your early childhood. Well, that's a blessing. Yes, it is a blessing. Mm. There are a few things more confronting than the thought we might lose our memories because they define us for ourselves. And dementia is the thief that will take them from us. Tonight on Four Corners, we investigate the long and controversial search for an effective treatment for the commonest form of dementia. We examine whether the science is actually taking us in the right direction, and the growing knowledge that while we wait for a drug that works, there's still a lot we can do to keep our brains in good shape. This is the Florey Institute in Melbourne. They're at the leading edge of research into the commonest form of dementia, Alzheimer's disease. Mr. Frank Fresky? Yes. Yeah, I'm Rob Williams. Uh, hi. Oh, come through and... This is Norma. Norma, come through and I'll, I'll explain everything to you. Thank you. Come through, Frank. Would you like to pop your glasses off, uh, please? Yeah and hop on the bed, head that way, feet down this way. Today, retired engineer Frank Fresky is having one of the most sophisticated brain scans there is. It's designed to detect a substance called amyloid, a marker of risk for Alzheimer's disease. It's very important you don't move at all during the scan. It takes about 20 minutes. The scan is monitoring how Frank's going in a trial of a new Alzheimer's medication. Professor Colin Masters is an investigator involved in screening people for clinical trials such as this. He's an individual who is cognitively normal, showing no overt signs of preclinical Alzheimer's disease, but we know that the amyloid is building up in his brain. Alzheimer's is a disease of the brain where the nerves are slowly surrounded by clumps or plaques of a protein called amyloid. As Alzheimer's progresses, the plaques spread to many parts of the brain. And this is the stuff that aggregates in your brain to cause the damage which we recognise as impairment of cognition in Alzheimer's disease, dementia. Here we see on this chart... Australian neuropathologist Professor Colin Masters has an international reputation for his decades of work on the theory that amyloid causes Alzheimer's disease. If we could dis discover what is causing the deposition of this abnormal protein, it would hold out some possibility of preventing the disease. I look down a microscope, I see this aggregating protein in the brain, and I see all the cells in the brain that are normally there to protect you getting very angry and trying to get it out. 
And that tells me that it cannot be a good thing to have. The trial that Frank's on is based on this idea that amyloid is the cause of Alzheimer's disease. The drug is aimed at removing as much amyloid as possible from the brain. And the drugs that we are using should delay the onset of any cognitive impairment if the trial is successful. So it's placebo controlled. He might be getting saline or he might be getting the active drug. Correct. He doesn't know whether he's on active or placebo, nor do I. Frank Fresky knows what Alzheimer's disease can do. He's trying to stave off what happened to his mother. It was very difficult. It was to lose um, the person that, that, that I knew so gradually and but evidently losing her, her very essence, her character, uh, her normal friendly nature, uh, her warm words to somebody that um, was becoming a different person. What's your hope? My hope? Oh, I mean, it'd be great if it was a cure. Can I tell you, Norman, I'd be wrapped if it was a cure and that I had a, a, um, Alzheimer's disease. At the very least, that it would mitigate some of the decline. Uh, that, that would be wonderful. Um, because I think recognising how my mother um, declined, uh, I would not want to put anybody through that, to be honest. I, I would hate to put anybody through that. I don't want to, I don't want to see that happen. This is the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute in Adelaide, where they assess people for eligibility for clinical trials. And I'm about to meet one of the people who run these trials, Dr. Kathy Short, a cognitive neurologist. Hi, Kathy, nice Hi, to see you. Hi, nice to see you. Shall we go upstairs? Yes, come in. Kathy Short is recruiting people at risk of Alzheimer's disease to see whether they're eligible for an experimental medication targeted at amyloid. So generally people who want to be involved are people that are worried about their risk. Um, if they've got a, someone in the family who um, has had dementia and they've seen them go through that um, and they want to find out what their personal risk is um, of developing dementia. So um, generally speaking, we see people, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, some are cognitively normal, some have mild subjective um, cognitive complaints. Um, but they need to have a reliable um, caregiver. They want. They need to, um, I guess, be interested in being involved in clinical drug trials, um, and be generally medically stable. Graham Edwards is here to see if he's eligible to join the trial. My mother had dementia. Uh, she developed it in her 70s, early 70s, and uh, it deteriorated quite rapidly towards the end. She had to go into a nursing home. So I'm aware of the effects of, uh, of, of the disease. And uh, so I, when I heard that they needed volunteers for uh, dementia studies, I thought I'd put my hand up. Did it create any anxiety about what they might find? No, not really. I, I'm of the opinion that it's better to know what's ahead of you than, uh, than to remain ignorant. Uh, you can prepare better for your life ahead. So, today we're going to do a few different tasks. Cognitive so testing is part of Graham's assessment. So, we're going to use these tokens. So, just lay them out. So, I'm going to give you some instructions and I'd like you to do what I say. Move the big red circle underneath the big green circle. Move the big black square to the right of the big yellow circle and touch the big black circle before you touch the big yellow square. OK. 
Okay. <laughs> Graham has already undergone an amyloid brain scan. Graham has been concerned about his memory uh, for a little while. Very mild, sort of subjective memory complaints. So his amyloid scan has come back showing a small amount of amyloid, um, but enough to still be considered positive. Um, so we've made him aware that that increases his risk of developing Alzheimer's disease um, and that he's now eligible to screen for one of the anti-amyloid drug trials. And if he were to go in the trial, what would the trial look like for him? It's a long trial. So the preclinical trials run generally about four years um, and they're placebo controlled. And the outcomes you're looking for? We know that these drugs are quite good at removing amyloid uh, to almost zero level. Um, but what we don't know is uh, what the clinical cognitive benefit will be. And also what we don't know is how long that benefit will last for, how quickly the amyloid reaccumulates. But even slowing a cognitive decline would be a win um, if we can you know, give people another five years um, of quality life. Um, that's going to make a massive difference uh, to people uh, around the world. It's going to make a massive difference to healthcare systems around the world as well. The race for an effective Alzheimer's drug is high risk and high reward. High reward because it will likely make a fortune. High risk because every anti-amyloid drug so far has failed. The betting has been on antibodies to remove amyloid. And one company, Biogen, pinned its hopes on a drug called aducanumab, brand name Aduhelm. Yours is hot. There was great excitement when the initial trials of aducanumab got underway in the United States. Former nurse and healthcare administrator Jerry Taylor joined the trial in 2015. Jerry had a family history of Alzheimer's and noticed the first signs of cognitive decline when she was 65. She got off the subway one time and didn't know why she'd gotten off at 14th Street. And, uh, Finally, one morning, she looked in the mirror and didn't recognize her own face. It was such a uh, thing that was so right to my heart. Um, I knew that my familial uh, people who also had it, that uh, that was going to be the start of another type of life for me. Jerry was put on monthly infusions of aducanumab, and for her, it seemed to be working. I thought it was helpful, very helpful. I've always felt that it helped me. We were very busy because we'd already started uh, speaking frequently, so we had a lot of travel and were making appearances, and Jerry did 50% of the speaking. Uh, unlike now, when it's, it's more challenging for her. But she, she was terrific, you know, really very, very slowly progressing. But in 2019, the trials came to a sudden halt when an independent committee reviewed the results to date. It's what's called a futility analysis. There were two major trials, and I think it was about March 2019, Biogen, the company, stopped the trials because they did a futility analysis. So they do an analysis halfway through, is it futile to keep going on? And the answer was yes. So the futility analysis suggested that there was no change in the state of these people, therefore there wasn't much point in continuing. Exactly, that there was no significant difference between the two groups and there was no point. So, uh, so the trials were stopped. When the trials were stopped, Jerry Taylor was taken off her treatment. During that period, uh, we noticed that she began to speak with greater effort, that she began to search for more words, have more trouble completing her thoughts. But Biogen had no intention of giving up on its investment in aducanumab. Even though we had this recent setback, we are not giving up. We remain in the fight against Alzheimer's disease. The company went back and reanalyzed their data. And then they found that there was benefit. 
for some. So in one trial, the people on the high dose of the drug showed some improvement in cognition compared to placebo. There was also removal of the amyloid protein from the brain, so there's all less plaques in the brain. Armed with its new analysis, Biogen went to the US Food and Drug Administration seeking approval for aducanumab. The FDA had a expert advisory committee. I think there were 11 people on that. These are the top experts in the US. Professor Joel Perlmutter was on that expert FDA advisory committee, which heard Biogen's evidence. But he said it wasn't like any meeting he'd been at for other drug applications. For six years I'd been on the committee. This particular meeting was different. And this raised eyebrows for those of us who were on the committee who were looking right at each other on our Zoom uh, computer screens. And the reason it was different is this was the first time in my experience that the FDA and the company, in this case Biogen, was presenting together rather than independently. And it seemed rather strange. And so that's what was a little bit troubling. And the way the data was presented seemed not so straightforward and it raised many concerns of those of us at the meeting. Biogen has told Four Corners that they presented with the FDA at the advisory meeting to increase the transparency of differences in viewpoints. They added, such joint documents are not unusual. There was another issue that concerned the committee. Some participants had side effects, brain swelling and bleeds. There was not only a lack of clinical benefit, there was very clear statistically strong side effects, untoward effects in the brain of these people, particularly at the higher dose, which was the recommended dose of this drug. And that, those abnormalities were 20% had micro, tiny little bleeds in their brain, and another 30 or 35% had focal, small areas of swelling in their brain. So this is not something that is, has no potential side effects. These are real brain effects. Australia took part in the expanded aducanumab trials, and Professor Amy Brotman ran a large trial site in Melbourne. The majority of people had no side effects, but there were some people who developed side effects. The changes were dramatic. I had radiologists calling me saying, what is this drug? What are you giving to this, to this person? So there's very dramatic changes in the brain. The expert committee advising the FDA was totally unconvinced by what Biogen had presented. When we reviewed the data in the presentation, none of us on the committee voted for approval. All of us, of the 11 people, 10 voted against, and one was uncertain. Yet, despite that advice, the FDA gave a green light to aducanumab. What could be a major medical breakthrough, the FDA approving the first new treatment for Alzheimer's in almost 20 years. The FDA says this one can likely treat the actual disease and not just alleviate symptoms. It's a contentious decision. Some experts and the FDA's independent advisory committee advised against it being approved. There was a sudden approval by the FDA called an accelerated approval of this drug. And when I heard about that, within 15 minutes, I resigned from that committee without talking to anybody else. It's my responsibility to protect vulnerable populations, vulnerable, desperate people. I would not prescribe it, and I would not prescribe it for myself or anybody else in my family because of this lack of benefit and substantial risk of side effects. Have you ever seen as much heat as there's been over this drug? The short answer is no. I've never seen, I've never seen people resign. I've never seen colleagues 
have almost stand-up arguments at conferences. I've never seen the press coverage that this drug has received. Advocates like Jim and Jerry Taylor, though, were delighted that aducanumab had been approved. We were joyful. We were... We were surprised because of all the controversy and because the experts had recommended that they not approve it. So we were not expecting a positive result. And, it, you know, it, it shot, it infused the entire community with hope because there has never been, while there's some drugs that modify the symptoms, there's never been what they call a disease-modifying therapy. But their joy was short-lived. It's fine having a drug approved, but someone has to pay for it. And the main funding organisation, US Medicare, warned that it was planning to restrict coverage for aducanumab only to people on clinical trials. Consumer groups were outraged. I'm here as the voice of my wife and my inspiration, Jerry. This decision will delay and set back the exciting drugs that are in the pipeline and now will not reach the people who need them most. But US Medicare US stood its ground, fine. citing safety risks and the need for more evidence of clinical benefit. I mean, they declined to reimburse the drug for anyone except those in a clinical trial. We felt, given that there are some very exciting drugs in the pipeline, this was totally unjustified and just inherently wrong and unconscionable. Do we deny this drug to millions of people around the world who have Alzheimer's while we wait another five to 10 years to prove clinical benefit? I don't know, if it was a disease of younger people, conditions that affect predominantly teenagers and young adults, this would probably be enough data at this stage. I do feel that the decision of the FDA was right and I think it's a little bit ageist of some people to say that they jumped too early. Biogen was also seeking approval for aducanumab in Australia, but told Four Corners it has withdrawn its application following interactions with the TGA indicating the data provided so far would not be sufficient to support a positive recommendation. Biogen also says it stands by the safety and efficacy of aducanumab. Aducanumab has paved the way for a family of similar drugs which are undergoing clinical trials. So uh, the research we're doing here is uh, looking at monoclonal antibodies to remove amyloid from the brain. Now, how our, many trials are you doing? Uh, we're, we're doing currently about 20 different trials at this 20. site. 20? But over the last 30 years, we've done about 200 different studies. 200? Which shows just how hard it is to change the brain. We Associate Professor right? Michael Woodward runs the Trial Centre for Dementia Drugs at Melbourne's Austin Health. Derek Scully is here with his wife, Sue. Hi, Derek. How are you? Hello. Do you want to come in for your infusion? The infusion is aducanumab. Grab a seat there. Yeah. Derek has to come in every month to have the medication and be monitored closely. Now, can I put a needle into this arm? Yes. Yep, excellent. Can I pull this up? Yep. OK, needle going in. All right, that's running now. Feels OK? Yeah, I'm fine. Yep. Yes. That looks all right. I'll just pull this down. Yep. Excellent. Are you OK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm fine. Yeah, cool? Yeah. <laughs> How have you been going on the trial? I think it's stopping him from deteriorating as quickly as he would have without yeah. it. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> when did you first notice that things were 
affecting the way you were thinking? Uh, a long time ago. Um, I would yeah, know how long. Six years ago. Right, yeah. Well, What's it like for you, Sue? Um, it, it's difficult. It, it's, um, it's quite sad, really. It's difficult having to do things on your own, and uh, um, as Derek was always the front man, and uh, he handled everything. Derek is all too aware of what he might be losing, including the memories of his days at Kakadu, where he used to work. We have good people like Aboriginal people. Uh, we've, you know, worked with them, and. Um, Nice memories. <laughs> Sorry. Nothing to apologise for. It's tough. He does remember lots of the, the past, much better, and, he, and that is lucky. We had a good, had a good laugh. What we're trying to do is to see whether removing amyloid alters the clinical course. Clearly, he's worse than he was, but what would he have been like if the amyloid had uh, remained and he, you know, he may not even be with us now? We don't know that for sure. There's a puzzle here, and it goes to the heart of the search for a drug that works. If amyloid is so important, why have all the anti-amyloid drugs in the past pretty much failed? These new antibody drugs are dramatically good at removing amyloid, yet not dramatically good at demonstrating cognitive benefits, at least not yet. One possible reason is that in the past, trials have been done in people whose disease may already be too advanced. Now, what happens is with amyloid is that it takes a long period of time, perhaps 20 to 30 years, for amyloid to uh, deposit in the brain and reach the threshold at which you might start seeing impairment. Maybe by the time we get the patients in the clinic and by the time we start the treatment, it may be too late already that uh, the damage has already been done. So at what age does this all begin? So some of the studies that actually look, have looked at people serially to track their amyloid in the brain, we can do that with a PET scan now, show that perhaps this is a 20 to 30 year process. So it's starting in midlife. So in your 50s or 60s? Maybe even earlier, maybe your 40s even, to some extent. We now understand that we must go even earlier, before the onset of cognitive impairment, into the preclinical stages of the disease. And we know that, uh, we think we know, that if we operate in that window of preclinical disease, we will have a much better chance of achieving a cognitive outcome of delaying the onset of cognitive impairment. There's another issue with amyloid. There's no inevitability that if you have amyloid in your brain, you'll develop Alzheimer's disease. There is very good evidence that the correlation between amyloid in the brain and cognitive function is not very high. And you can have amyloid in the brain and be well-functioning, cognitively normal, or you can have dementia and have amyloid in the brain. If you look at people over 60 or 65 and do amyloid PET scans, a third of people, including myself, would be one of those people, potentially, will have amyloid in their brain. It doesn't mean they're all going to have Alzheimer's disease, dementia. No one has definitively proven that reducing amyloid affects Alzheimer's symptoms. That's why US Medicare wouldn't pay hundreds of millions of dollars to Biogen just for amyloid removal. Before they even started this trial, if you were a betting person, given the history of failure of amyloid drugs over the last 20 years, you'd bet on this not working. What we have never seen so far, and in terms of whether you're a betting person, is any 
improvement in function or any what we'd say clinically, clinically meaningful response that is a reduction or slowing of the dementia process of the cognitive problems. Um, so yes, if you were a betting person, um, you would have put your money on this not working. Amyloid, though, does seem to trigger the second brain marker for Alzheimer's, a toxic protein called tau, which gets tangled up inside nerves. So, Rob, when somebody's had their PET scan, this is the 3D image that you get? Yes, you've got uh, a person who's negative on the left and a person who's got amyloid on the right. You can see the details of the scanning over here. You've got the CT, and this is a tau scan. You can see the uh, tau accumulating in, in all different parts of the brain. Um, and that's the precursor to when symptoms begin to appear. And there are trials going on which are testing anti-tau medications. It may be one drug isn't enough. It may be we'd need a drug against the tau protein and the A-beta protein. Many conditions in medicine, we use multiple drug therapies, not just one treatment to treat it. Chair of Dementia Australia, Graham Samuel, is concerned that dementia research has been too narrowly focused. We've had too many decades since the discovery of, for example, Alzheimer's disease. We've had too many centuries of dementia with no cure, no prevention, no delay. So we ought to be able to find something. Um, and, and it's no use saying, I will focus on this area and foreclose research into a whole range of other areas. That's, that's not the way research ought to be conducted. I think in dementia research, there hasn't been the diversity of opinion that there is in so many other research communities in terms of what's causing different diseases or how best to treat. There has been um, a reduction in that debate because there have been some very big ideas and big hypotheses and big voices that have to some extent dominated the debate. The critics would say, well, look, for every development in amyloid drugs or removal of amyloid and not showing a benefit, you've moved earlier and earlier, when are you going to give up here and say, well, look, it's just not working as a theory? Well, we give up when the uh, data says that we're wasting our time. At this point, the data is so exciting and so compelling that one would not give up at this point. The aim of drug therapy for Alzheimer's disease is to slow or halt the brain damage. But what if I were to tell you that there are already interventions which may help to do this, and they don't necessarily involve drugs? Lifestyle interventions may have a role in delaying the onset of dementia, maybe not preventing it altogether, but delaying it. And of course, it's because it's a disease of late life, the more you can delay it, the less likely you are to suffer from it. Come on, guys. Find the kitchen. Come on, guys. Here we go. <laughs> Good boy. Where's the kitchen? Kitchen! We're going to have some pasta. Come and see what Nono's been cooking. We're going to have some pasta. Oh, I think... What are they? Tomatoes. Tomatoes. And that's a salad. OK. Let's <laughs> get a serve of good Aussie olive oil. Frank's background, being from Italy, he has that Mediterranean diet. He doesn't do the, you know, the fast food. He doesn't do the pre-prepared meals and things like that. It's always usually very fresh produce and you know, the olive oils and things like that. And there's evidence that a Mediterranean diet slows down brain aging and makes for healthier blood vessels. Cheers. 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 And Frank is highly motivated to do everything he can to prevent dementia. Oh, yeah. very good. It hurts those around you very, very much. And uh, my two grandsons that I enjoy, I would, um, I would not want them to see me that way. I sort of see them at the age they're at, two and, two and four, and I think they, they wouldn't understand and they would be distressed to see if I changed the way my mother changed. And for Frank, it's also about mixing with others, social engagement, which in fact may also be protective. 
Buon appetito. I'm going to make the best of what I have every day, do the things that I love doing. The, the element to all of this is a social element, which is about conversations, discussions, raising issues, uh, over a coffee, over a simple meal, uh, always. It has a connection. You don't like the chunky part. If we get the whole population to be exercising more, eating more healthily, uh, being more cognitively and socially engaged, um, managing their depression or anxiety and their blood pressure, not smoking and drinking in moderation only, that would be, that would reap enormous dividends for them and for society and for our economy. Dementia authority Professor Henry Bradati walks the talk, well, cycles it at least, when it comes to dementia prevention. The Henry Bradati program is to exercise every morning. I do an hour every morning of exercise. I generally cycle. Um, I try and mix it up a bit. I'll swim um, every two or three days. I go kayaking once a week, but I do something. And I love it. I'm addicted to it, so it, not, not a chore at all. Um, I'm a vegetarian. Occasionally eat fish, um, so pescatarian, if you like. Uh, I eat a Mediterranean-style diet. I have a lot of vegetables and fruit and olive oil. So keeping physically active, um, very, very important. Um, making sure you get enough sleep. <laughs> um, and education um, is really important. So making sure that you finish high school, you know, perhaps going on and doing tertiary studies if possible. If not, you know, making sure that you keep your brain active and engaged um, is really, really important. And also continuing to follow a healthy diet. That's my baby. Come on, Bubby. Come on, Bubby. Come on, Bubby. The question is, what effect changing lifestyle has if you've already got impairment? The research isn't in, but Derek is not just relying on his medication. He's intent on living better with dementia. Hello, little one. Oops. See his little ears. Oops. Yep. Hang on. Going swimming today? Yeah. Yep. Great. Yeah. This this man goes along the edge in case I fall off it. <laughs> have you got all your gear, D? Huh? Your goggles? Have you got your goggles and your towel? Yeah, yeah. Got, where where yeah. is it, though? Right here. Right. So if you walk down the ramp like you usually do and then just go in the long one, all right, you want to go down? We'd spend an hour and a half to two hours in the water. It's a very good setup for everyone. You can't sort of go past like a, a rocket. You sort of <laughs> you're paddling along. But, uh, it's all right. Yeah, it's good actually. We do know from all our experience that the more you can keep people in society, it does have a tendency to slow down the cognitive decline. It does mean having dementia-friendly communities, means removing the stigma, having people understand what dementia is, because it's terribly important to keep people who have been diagnosed with dementia at home and in society and in the community for as long as possible. Uh, serpents, another word for serpents. Um. Begins with an A. Asper. Excellent. Yep. People who are living with dementia, have been diagnosed with dementia, need so much tender loving care. They need to be kept at home and in the community for as long as possible. That's right. Yeah, I should think so. <laughs> and that's what Susan Bailey provides for Stephen, her husband of over 60 years. She's made the house as dementia friendly as she can. Yes, yes, that's uh, we, we, we write everything, I write everything up there for Stephen to remember, oh, such as to help him. And, um, and you've labelled the cupboards as well? Uh, yes, I believe in that because uh, it's sometimes very hard when we empty the, the dishwasher and Stephen wonders, you know, where. And so it's now they're used to help him do that as well. 
The Baileys also have a simple audio device which feeds a very old passion of Stevens, Gilbert and Sullivan. One of Stephen's great joys is Canberra's Alchemy Chorus. It's made up of people living with dementia, their carers and volunteers. We initially started it for people who were in the mild to moderate stages of dementia who were still living at home because we thought that was a forgotten group. So as long as they come in with those, uh, under those sort of criteria, they're with us forever. We run the men, we run the men, we run the men, we run the men, we show the world of old John The Alchemy Chorus has close to it all. Mental stimulation, social engagement, and even a bit of exercise. I'll have, I'll have a bit of action while, while we're singing. And the crowd seems to enjoy it too. We run them in, we run them in, we run them in, we run them in, we show them where. Alzheimer's disease or dementia, it's very, very isolating. It's in the closet. We don't want it in the closet. We want people with Alzheimer's and people with dementia to be out of the closet, to talk about it. What is dementia? I don't know. Now I'm carrying on regardless. We shall overcome. Overcoming dementia is one of the biggest health challenges that Australia faces. Drugs will help some one day. But in the meantime, there's so much that can be done as long as we don't lose hope. For information about dementia advice or support, phone the National Dementia Helpline on 1800 100 500.